Hi, I'm Dr. John Martin with Ivy Family Health Updates. I'm here today with my brother, Dr. Ed Martin, my sister, Dr. Catherine Martin, and our special guest today is Dr. Mark Avila. Mark is a graduate of the University of Southern California and Marquette Medical School. He then did a uh, residency at the University of Arizona, followed by a fellowship in hepatology, which is the study of liver disease at the University of Miami, and after that, he did a gastroenterology fellowship at the University of Florida. He's now here working in Miami, has a great practice, and we're very happy to have him here with us today to talk about hepatitis C. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about uh, hepatitis C, because I know that we have three doctors here who are unsure of sort of what's new in hepatitis C, new treatments, you know, is it uh, a lot more prevalent than it used to be? So. Hepatitis C is a disease characterized by a, an infection that develops chronicity, which means the development of chronic disease over six months, beyond six months. And it, it's more prevalent because we now, in the last 20 years, have been able to identify the virus in our blood. Many people knew the virus existed way back in the 70s and the 80s, but we called it non-A, non-B because we couldn't identify exactly what the virus was. In 1990, we were able to identify the virus as hepatitis C, which opened up a tremendous amount of treatment options for us because not only could we identify infected blood and blood products, but we could develop treatments. The treatment mainstay for this disease is interferon. Interferon is a medication. It's an immunomodulating medication, which means it alters the immune system of the host so that it can fight the virus. This treatment is very tough. Nonetheless, that many patients who have this therapy, the range of time from being on the medication is anywhere from 6 to 12 months, and it's very, very difficult. When we first started treating this disease, it was used with interferon only, and over the last 15 years, we've developed a regimen called a pegylated interferon, which is just basically a big molecule that stays in our blood system for a lot longer, and it allows us the capability of giving the injections once a week instead of three times a week. This is the mainstay of therapy at this time, and depending on what kind of virus you have, tells us how long that patient should be treated. In the world, there are six types of hepatitis C, and in the United States and North America, genotype 1 is the most common and unfortunately the most difficult to treat. That usually requires about a year of therapy. If these patients respond within three months of being on the medication, which means we check your, we take your blood, and if the virus is now absent, because we have now tremendously advanced our laboratory skills, that we can actually detect how much of the virus at any particular time the virus is present. And if the virus is absent in three months, you have a very good chance that you're going to eliminate the virus in 12 months, at which time we stop the therapy. The most important time is the six months following to make sure that off therapy, you've maintained a viral load, which is no virus, in the blood. Yet, even with this advanced therapy, we're only getting about 60 to 65 percent of hepatitis G genotype 1 patients. So, the next medication that's going to be coming down the line is actually another medication to be used in conjunction with the two medications we give right now. And so, it's going to be triple therapy. So, it, it's not going to change in the sense that the interferon is not going to be utilized. It's going to be used in addition to the interferon and retroviron. But hepatitis C is a very, very difficult disease. Unfortunately, we don't have a vaccine for it because it, it, it rapidly mutates in the system. So there's inability to obtain a virus, uh, I mean, a uh, vaccine, as opposed to hepatitis A and hepatitis B, which we now have vaccines for. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason somebody who has never been exposed to either one of those two viruses should not be considered for a vaccine to prevent the disease. But hepatitis C is a very difficult disease to, to, to even consider a vaccine, and I don't think a vaccine is even in the pipeline. Could you talk a little bit, I mean, some people may not be familiar with the side effects of interferon, which are, you mentioned that it's a tough, tough if you look at If you look at the prospect paper that tells you the, of the possible side effects, I've seen patients that have every one of them. <laughs> but, the med, but by and large, the, 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 the side effects of interferon are fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, you certainly get fever and chills when you give yourself the shot, um, you can get depression, 
you get local rashes, you get low blood counts, you not only get anemic, your white count drops, your platelet count can drop. Um, there's a lot of other psychological problems that happen. They get severely depressed. Mm -hmm. They get um, fatigued. They, like I said, they lose weight. Some people don't lose weight. And this is, of course, a gamut. This is the range of things that can happen while in interferon. Not everybody has them, but there's certainly a possibility. Uh, the ribavirin is a pill that's used in conjunction, and by and large, 100% of the people will develop anemia, which was our problem when this medication started many years ago because we had to stop the therapy if the anemia became more profound. And certainly, you can imagine somebody who's 60 years old develops an anemia over a period of a month, they can get chest pain because they have anemia. They get, it's like a, like a stress test for them. If they drop the hemoglobin significantly, the heart has to work harder and it can precipitate an angina attack. So we don't let that happen anymore. We use a lot of uh, medications to, to, to raise the blood count, like Neupogen and Epigen, so that we don't have to stop our medication nowadays. So the therapy has improved significantly over the last 10, 15 years so that we don't have to adjust or change the therapy. Can you go over a little bit too, I'm sorry, about how do we, how do we get the hepatitis C? What are the people's symptoms? How do they know that they have? Hepatitis C is a blood-borne disease. It's, in, it's somebody who's got infected with a blood uh, product. Now, this can be, typically it's a blood transfusion. It could be intravenous use of a, of a needle one time 20 years ago. It doesn't have to be continued repeated use. And they don't have to have a, remem a memory of becoming sick or jaundice when they had used IV drugs. So it's not something that they have to remember. Uh, people who have been injected with uh, syringes that were made of glass, I don't know if it's, uh, if you can remember, but I certainly can remember as a child getting an injection from the family doctor of an antibiotic with a syringe that was glass. Well, right. it wasn't sterilized. Perhaps it wasn't sterilized in an appropriate fashion. And in a lot of third world countries, the, the technique and the technology was not available to sterilize syringes. So, for instance, now we see a tremendous amount in the human population who had infections from hepatitis C because they were all injected, not only because they were sick, but because they were well and got vitamin injections. That's typical, and they got injected with syringes of glass that were not sterilized. So there's a tremendous population that can get hepatitis C. Anybody who's had a, um, a piercing, um, what other possibilities? Tattoos, the use of intranasal cocaine, because it can in, the, the tube inserted into the nose can pierce the nasal mucosa and you can go from one person to the next. So there's a lot of reasons to think of the possibility that you could have been given infected blood. And there's always a question about sexual transmission. And I think when this disease first appeared, we thought the disease was very unlikely to be transmitted sexually, but there indeed have been cases of sexual transmission. And I think the recommendations by the CCD, CDC at the present time is that if you have multiple sexual partners, then obviously the possibility of transmission because of blood-blood contact is present, so to use protection. I think that could be said for many sexually transmitted diseases. Right. And to be answered some of them, but I know we've been reading recently now, there's talking more, you know, we should be doing more screening for some of these diseases now that we have treatment for mentioning so of HIV. Are you seeing at this point that there's any suggestion that hepatitis C be something that we would be looking for routinely? Or? I think if you ever consider that there's a possibility that somebody had got infected, that they should be tested. I think it's a very easy screening test, and they have they have improved the technology and the laboratory methods to, to check an antibody for hepatitis C that I think anybody who considers a possibility that they could have been infected or been exposed or had blood contact, that they should be tested. Now, are there some people who will have been exposed and they may have sort of dormant hepatitis C and will never actually become a fulminant or a chronic Correct. case? If you infect 100 people with hepatitis C virus, it's estimated that approximately 80% of the time that person will develop chronicity, meaning they may have a virus in their system for 10, 20, 30 years and never even know that it was there. Right. But that means that there's a probably about 20% time, 20% chance that they have been exposed, but they were able to resolve the virus infection, either because the virus wasn't strong enough or they were able to develop antibodies in their own protective immune mechanism to get rid of the virus. Okay. But by and large, most people get infected and get chronic disease. And like I was saying, if you screen and someone was positive for exposure, would you then go ahead and treat them? 
If somebody becomes positive for hepatitis E antibody, that's just detecting that the antibody is present. Okay. You then are obligated to find out if the virus is present in that person. Are they one of the 20% chance of people that got the virus, got the antibody, and it got rid of it? Right. Or do they have active viral infection? So at that point, you would take a good history, see if it's a possibility, and then you would check a, a viral load and possibly a genotype to see if they're good candidates for treatment. Okay. Very good. Very important. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Mark Avenel, thank you for being with us here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.